The economics of information security is a topic that is like wildly important, especially with the amount of money that goes into cybercrime every year and the amount of money that goes into security technologies that vendors produce and businesses consume. It's a multi, multi billion dollar industry. But is it actually moving you know, the threat space any lower as far as security posture goes and as far as threat landscape, attack surface, all these things today? I am super excited that we are going to be talking to Dr. Ross Anderson from the University of Cambridge. He has a background in math, has done a million things with cryptography. He wrote a seminal paper in 2000 called Why Information Security is Hard in Economic Perspective, which kind of launched this entire a research area around economics and information security. So we're going to get into that today. I'm super excited. Let's bring in Dr. Anderson. Hey, Dr. Anderson, thanks for being with us today. Hi. So, you know, I really want to just dive right into the economics of information security. And one question that I've been dying to ask you for probably three years now when you wrote that paper in, in 2000 on the economics of information security, what was the what was the catalyst that caused you to think like we should really look at information security from this angle, from this perspective, because it's interesting? Well, the catalyst was a meeting with Hal Varian, um, who was then a professor of economics at UC Berkeley and is now Google's chief economist. And Hal had been doing some work for antivirus companies and was trying to figure out why they weren't selling as uh, much antivirus software as they'd hoped to. Um, and I had been looking at um, how much money banks had been spending on cyber security and comparing that between the UK and the USA. And I couldn't understand um, um, the kind of measurements uh, that um, I was getting. And the two of us basically sat for an hour um, during the uh, the Auckland conference, IEEE Security and Privacy, which was at Berkeley back in those days. And um, uh, we figured out that um, it was time that economists and security engineers started talking to each other. Because to cut a long story short, uh, many of the things that go wrong in real life was, uh, occur when incentives are misaligned. Um, if Alice is guarding a system and Bob is paying the cost of failure, that's when things go wrong because Alice hasn't got an incentive to work hard enough and Bob gets hit with stuff that he can't do anything about. A good example of this is fraud against payment systems uh, because if you want something like a credit card system or a debit card system to be properly defended, then you need the merchants and the banks who buy transactions from the merchants, the so-called acquiring banks, to take care. However, the costs of fraud end up falling on the cardholders and on the banks who issue cards to them. Right, And although these may be the same banks, they're different um, departments of the same banks and the loss is diffused in different ways. And as a result, you don't have adequate incentives to provide the right level of protection. You know, that was in that was in 2000. And I agree with the asymmetric information and, you know, as you said, misaligned incentives. They, it was definitely an issue. We've had 20 years. I know that there is an annual conference once every other year held in the United States and then Europe around the economics of information security. Has yep. the industry made any progress in realigning those incentives? And if yes, how did they do that? And if not, what is preventing that? Well, one of the first topics that came up at the uh, workshop on the economics of information security around about 2003, 2006, was responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities. Uh, because back in 2002, when Y started, um, you had just seen the um, first um, um, companies that would pay for vulnerabilities. That was actually an idea that was first uh, mooted at the first WISE conference. But you had um, a community that was split between some people who, when they discovered a vulnerability, would just put it on bug track because they reckoned that unless you publicize the vulnerability, there's no way that Microsoft would fix it. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you had people, particularly around the Department of Defense, took the view that bugs should never be reported because there was an opportunity for the bad guys to attack us during the period between the bug being reported and fixed. And so there was a whole series of papers and a whole lot of empirical research on this. And there was a big debate in WISE 2004 uh, between people from the two communities. And what that led to was the current regime of responsible disclosure, whereby someone will disclose a bug, for example, to CERT, and they will then start a clock ticking for 90 days 
during which Microsoft or whatever vendor it is will have to ship a patch. And at the end of that period, um, uh, CERT will publicize the vulnerability. And this improves the incentives for all the actors because firstly, uh, Microsoft gets a steady flow of vulnerabilities that they can work on in an, in an industrial way. And second, uh, the people who disclose the vulnerabilities get liability shield from the fact that it's been disclosed through a government agency. Now, that wasn't the end of the story uh, because since then we've seen the, the spread of vulnerability markets and bug bounties. And typically in order to get a bug bounty, you've got to disclose your bug direct to the vendor rather than through the search system. But this is an evolving system, right? Which is, um, it's still got its problems, but it's something with which security economists have been concerned over the past 20 years. I was going to ask you what your thoughts were around these bug bounty platforms. There's a couple huge ones, right, that, that kind of consume that space. And I know that there's a big one in Europe as well. Do you see that as helping, you know, a, a, I guess, allowing mainstream access? Because if you're just submitting to CERT, that is a bit of a bottleneck, especially if you have, you know, let's say thousands of, of submissions, some legit, some, you know, um, not actual valid bugs that need to be worked. Do, do you find that these responsible disclosure platforms, these bug bounty platforms are greasing the skids, if you were, to to make these vendor products better solutions and, and I guess, align the incentives? Well, we've been doing some research on that recently because um, last year we came up with a vulnerability, the Trojan source vulnerability, where basically we use homoglyphs or bidirectional control characters in source code um, to see to it that the source code as seen by a compiler is different from that as seen by a human. And this means that if you go to a project like Linux or WebKit or whatever, where anybody in the world can contribute an update, which then may be um, put into the source code following human inspection, if you can create code in such a way that the human inspector can be fooled, there's a way to get supply chain attacks underway. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it was an attack simultaneously on almost all computer languages, um, at least all modern ones, with the exception of Haskell, and almost all editors and um, code repository front ends. So we ended up uh, disclosing it to about 20 big players, and there was an enormously different um, series of responses from, um, from, from different language maintainers. The people who maintain Rust, for example, were very, very keen to ship a patch as soon as possible, whereas the people at Oracle who maintain Java took the view that, well, um, you know, this is an issue for the, the code editor. So in the, the process of doing this disclosure, we managed to get some very interesting data on what's happening um, with the uh, bug bounty platforms that about half of the big firms use as their front ends. And what we discovered was that these platforms um, may be efficient um, at dealing with standard well-known types of vulnerability, but they're usually not much good at dealing with novel types of vulnerability like the one that we had. And in almost all cases, um, when we um, disclose through a channel like that, uh, the channel said, sorry, this isn't a vulnerability, go away, because the scope that they had been given by their clients didn't include anything novel. So we ended up having to go to their clients, you know, to the um, the language maintainer or the editor maintainer and say, oi, you know, there's a vulnerability here that um, your front end ha has wrongly filtered out, please pay attention to it. So yeah. that, that that's research that will be published in the next couple of months. But you can understand this entirely um, uh, adequately in terms of the security economics, in terms of the incentives facing the various bug bounty platforms and, and operators. Like you point out, I guess, a shortcoming or a, a, um, a, a constraint, if you will, with these major bug bounty platforms, because they do have to evaluate the submissions. And if you are submitting something that is novel, um, you know, that person's going to be like, oh, this isn't legit or it's out of scope. So I had never considered that as a constraint. Mm -hmm. So well, we, hadn't, we hadn't either. It's only later once we started talking to engineers involved in the process that one of them remarked to us, yes, writing the scopes for vulnerabilities is actually an extremely difficult process because it's difficult to anticipate vulnerabilities that you've never thought of before.
Yeah. So it's difficult for the the for for for, for the, the the software vendor to make a a, a complete contract with the uh, bug bounty platform. One of the one of the um, concerns, or one of the things that I say regularly on Simply Cyber, is, and something that you you know very well articulated in your paper, is the 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 idea that vendors want to be first to market. Right. They, they'll they'll ship on Monday and patch on Wednesday, because if they get in the market, consumers can buy it. And then they've got, you know, either vendor lock in or they've got adoption for a wider base. Yeah, we see this with um, IOT devices, which are just absolutely rampant everywhere, especially with like how the cost of technology has gone down and the ease to, to be able to ship with all these IOT devices. Are you still seeing this kind of first to market um I believe you call it a perverse incentive in your paper. Are, is is this still a common thing? Even though everybody, you know, even non-tech people roundly agree that they want and need security, but they're willing to, you know, purchase these products or or vendors are willing to develop products that are more focused on first to market. What What is the current state with that that you're seeing? Well, um, where you've got a market race where somebody's trying to be the first PC operating system or the first social network or the first platform for sharing short videos, um, then, of course, um, the market race dominates everything else and you end up having an incentive for the platform to focus on the convenience of its complementers and then go back and secure the platform only later. Um, there are also... Um, you know, operational things to do with the way that companies grow. Because if you set up a new company like Instagram, for example, and you get millions and millions of users while you've still only got two dozen staff, then you can't really do much in terms of trust and safety, right? Because you don't have enough staff to answer the phone. Okay, so it's only going to be when you sell out to somebody like Facebook that you're going to see experienced trust and security teams being um, shipped in there. And what you also see um, is that where there are, are systems which, um, you know, where the security is, you know, not just about something, uh, you know, like fraud, but, you know, it's about personal safety, that um, thanks to the current regulation of the internet with, you know, Section 230 and so on resulting in uh, big platforms escaping liability, that the uh, platforms aren't going to have an incentive to provide as much in terms of trust and safety and pushing back on abuse of various kinds as would be the case um, if things were more closely regulated as in other industries. And so that's why we're seeing in Europe, for example, um, that there's a push with a couple of digital services laws to basically compel the large platforms to do an awful lot more to protect their users against various kinds of online harm. Now, that is... Um, not to do with the race to market. That's just to do with the fact that the, the platform can get away with lots of stuff, and so it does while it can. If I can give you an example, um, until two or three years ago, um, Uber, for example, in London, was very cavalier about who it hired and um, about working hours. And so you had people being hired as drivers who had criminal records and uh, drivers being worked 14 hours a day. And so you had fatal accidents, you had uh, drivers raping passengers and Uber not reporting it. And eventually the mayor of London said, look guys, you're a taxi service and I'm pulling your license. You can say you're a platform, I don't believe you, see you in court. Yeah. And, that, I mean, um, that would certainly get their attention. <laughs> it, got, it got their attention. It got the, uh, the Uber CEO fired. The new CEO, um, you know, has now seen to it that taxis in London, which operate for Uber, all have proper minicab licenses, that they all have, um, you know, criminal records, background checks for the driver and so on and so forth. Because ultimately, um, you know, we have governments for a purpose and we have laws and regulations for a purpose and where some... A new kind of economic activity escapes that for a while. There will be bad actors, and eventually the lawmakers are going to act. Is there any merit to the argument that, you know, you can't account for everything when you're designing a product? And and I think of Zoom during the beginning of the pandemic. You know, it it was a platform they had tried to put in security. But when you got this unbelievable surge of adoption and your user base gets gigantic, these fringe cases, these these use cases that you may not have considered, 
uh, begin to crop up. And I, I will credit Zoom for getting a lot of issues right up front and then addressing them as it happened. But is there any merit to being first to market and, and, and trying your best to secure it, but really relying on the user base to find those fringe cases um, you know, and, and then be able to correct them? Well, I think Zoom was so successful because their product is so much more usable um, than the products that went before. Um, if you re remember what WebEx was like in the old days when it was a monopolist, for example, it was truly dreadful. And even at the beginning of the pandemic, we tried out about 20 different platforms. And some of them, including Cisco, were so bad that we um, had to abandon you know, doing our weekly security group meeting on them. Um, things improved rapidly um, because there was clearly a lot of business to be had. Um, and of course, once you start rolling out a thing at scale, then you will discover lots of, um, of issues, whether they're bugs or whether they're abuse cases that you hadn't anticipated. And you're going to have to keep on uh, fixing your product. I and mean, that's just part of what security engineering um, is like. Um, you know, and software, thankfully, um, lets you patch products um, an awful lot more easily and cheaply than is the case if you had to recall cars for some mechanical fix. Yeah, it, it, it does undermine the social contract. And for that reason, you know, people who care about the rule of law and, uh, and uh, stuff like that should pay attention to this. Dr. Anderson, I could talk to you forever, <laughs> honestly, but uh, this is our time. I want to thank you, like, really, really thank you. I genuinely appreciate you taking time, coming to talk to the Simply Cyber community, bringing a lot of thought-provoking ideas. Um, Guys, if you if you want Dr. Anderson's page, if you Google his name with Cambridge, he's got you must have a hundred academic research papers across various topics, uh, mm -hmm. including economics of information security, which is my personal favorite to read. Um, go check it out. He wrote the book literally on security engineering. Um, it's he made it freely available as well. I think some of your courses are freely available. There it is. Yeah, yeah. This, this 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 is the book. Um, yeah. the um, there's half a dozen um, chapters you can download for free, and the old editions are completely for free. And um, I've also got um, videos of security engineering classes that I do for um, first-year students at Cambridge and a separate um, set of classes that I do for fourth-year students at Edinburgh. And these can all be downloaded from my website. Yep. And I'm going to put... I'm going to put all the links in the description below so everybody can be able to get right to it wicked fast and start consuming um, your, your education, your knowledge, and your, your research, frankly. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I hope to speak with you again, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Well, thank you, Dr. Raga.